up a lot in, in the scriptures. It comes up a lot in, in the Gospels. Um, and it comes up um, a tremendous amount in the epistles of, of St. Paul. And then it's this idea that one of the things that Christ does, one of the things that he brings, perhaps even the main thing that he brings, is freedom. Brings you some sort of liberty. And this is understood um, chiefly in, in, in three ways. Um, deliverance from, from evil, from, from the power of sin over your life, and from death. And it's this idea that we live in a world, both internally, right, in, in, inside of ourselves, right, our own desires and thoughts and passions, and also in societies, and also in, in, in a natural world that's very oppressive. That is to say that leaves us unfree to actually do what we would like. I mean, think about all the ways that you're not free. Right? You know, you don't get to choose what family you're born into, what time period you're born into. You don't get to choose what country you live in, you know. Oftentimes you don't get to choose kind of your natural abilities and your genes and genetics that determine a lot of, of who you are. And for most of us, we don't get to choose when we're going to die or how we're going to die or when we're going to get sick or often what other people are going to do to us. And in, in society, even our own, and even more dysfunctional societies that are <coughs> ripe with corruption, so many people are in um, situations in life because of the way other people decided to treat them and the ways that we decided to set up societies, they're not free either. Think of many of the people in India who live in a caste system where they're not free to leave a certain kind of place that has been set up for them. Or think about African Americans during slavery in this country. Or Native Americans and the, way, and the things that we did to them, shoving them, on plant, uh, shoving them on reservations. There's so many people in so many places Right? That, that, that aren't free. And even in our own lives internally, we lack a lot of freedom. You know, Paul has this great saying, he says, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, those I do. And he's meditating on this idea that so often our passions, our desires, and our thoughts rule us. They run our life. And we just run around, we're like little people running around just erratically doing whatever thoughts happen to come into our head and whatever desires happen to be flowing through our veins. And at the root of, of, of all of these kind of destructive and oppressive thoughts and feelings, that, that, is, that is desires and thoughts which don't allow us to actually exercise our will as we would want it to be, which impair our judgment and our reason. At the root of it is two things, either some type of desire of wanting something you don't have, or fear of being afraid of something. And this comes out of the fact that we, unlike God, can never truly be free. You know, we, God is all-powerful and almighty, and so there's nothing that constrains him. But we're not like that. And so even if we think we have a certain freedom, like, oh, I get to do what I want now, right? I'm doing what I want, what I feel like. That's only a pseudo-freedom. Because in the end, as human beings and as things that are created, we have to submit, we have to align ourselves with something great, bigger and greater than ourselves. We can't be absolutely free in the same way that God is. And we live in a land that has taken this gospel message of freedom very seriously and done much in the external and societal ways that we can to guarantee freedom for people, much more than many societies before us. But what governments can't do is they can't guarantee your internal freedom. That's the freedom that lies inside of you, whether you're free from sin running your life from these desires and fears making you do things that you don't want to do that you regret later. Or maybe you don't regret them you should. So we have this two-fold challenge. And that's to work for an inner freedom of our soul and work to preserve the freedoms we have in this country and our societies and to make progress in making it a more free place. And why why do that? 
Because God lets us be free. You see, unlike sin and evil and death, those are all things that take your freedom away, that make choices for you, that force things upon you. But God he doesn't do that. God doesn't make you do anything, ever. He lets you choose your own life, for better or for worse. He doesn't make us love him. He doesn't force himself upon us. And you see, not only did he let us be free, but he came to ensure our freedom, to deliver us from oppression. This is why Jesus Christ comes down in the form of man and the cross and conquers death. This is, this is the whole point of, of Pascha, of Easter, is that we're delivered, we're freed from death. I mean, think how many things in your life exist because, of, because death exists. Almost everything about you, the way you are, is because of death. Me. So God comes down and he frees, he frees us and delivers us. Shouldn't we also do the same for those around us? If God doesn't make us be like he wants us to be, shouldn't we also let other people around us and in our lives be free? Shouldn't we stop trying to take our friends and our families and our loved ones and trying to mold them into our image that we have in mind for them? So much of dysfunctional relationships comes down to this especially Americans, and it's very hard, is that you have to let that other person be themselves. It doesn't mean you have to approve of things that are destructive and harmful and evil, but it means that you have to let them be free. Because if someone doesn't freely become the person that God has in mind for them, if they don't freely conform themselves to the image of God, then whatever they become is fake and false. It's just like there is no love that forces someone to love them, right? right? Love is free. You can't make someone love you. You can't make someone become the person you want them to be. They have to choose that. And so we, like God, need to let people go. In our life, in society around us, we have to stop getting so upset and so frustrated and so mad at other people because they're not like we want them to be. So think to yourself, how often do you try to control other people or manipulate them or guilt trip them or pressure people in any way? We do this, I do this, countless times in a day. And it's all because what we're doing is we are choosing the side of death every time we do that. Because death oppresses people and enslaves them. God frees people and lets them be free. And we need to do the same thing in our own lives, in the relationships that are dear to us. And even if we think we know what's good for somebody else, right? Even if we have their best intentions at heart, I mean, assuming you even know what's best for somebody, right? We often kind of arrogantly think that we do. But even if we do, we need to make sure that when we're working for the best for somebody else, that we're doing it for with pure motives and intentions. That is to say, we're doing it for their sake and not ours. So often, we want loved ones to do what's best for them. But oftentimes, we do it because we want it for ourselves more than we want it for them. And that's a hard distinction to make. But we have to make sure that we, that we have a purity of heart. If we don't have that purity, we need to back off. We also need to work for this in, our, in the societies that we live in. We live in a society that has a lot of freedom, that lets people be, for better or for worse. But you know what comes out of that freedom? A lot more authenticity. People being real and genuine and not having a lot of fake things. Right? You live in a country where everyone say Orthodox, right? Or Catholic. And you go back a few hundred years where everything kind of had to be that way. Back when it wasn't giving donations, right? Like in England, you got taxed, a church tax, you just had to pay, right? 
So many things were compulsory. And what happens when you take all that compulsion away, say in religion? <laughs> well, you see how people really are. Right? You see what they really want. They might not have many people in churches, but people are here because they freely choose to be. And that's worth an awful lot. So both in our own lives and in the societies we live in, we need to work for freedom. Actively work for it. In societies, there are a lot of ways in which people aren't free. We might have gotten rid of slavery, right? We might live in America, but there are a lot of ways in which people aren't free. <coughs> Do you know in this country that there are almost a million people who are sex slaves in this country right now? About like half a million get trafficked over our borders every year. I'm sure you're aware that there's children and women who are trapped in very domestic, trapped in situations with lots of domestic abuse where they can't escape. There are workers, especially migrant workers or illegal workers, who come here and are taken advantage of, who are near slaves working in this country. There was a great article, uh, a great report on this on NPR that did this, um, or maybe it was, uh, no, it was the New York Times, about um, Vietnamese women, right, who do all the nails, all the nail shops, right? And the working conditions that go on there. I mean, most of these women are like practically slaves. Like they don't, get, they don't get paid minimum wage, they take their wages from them, they have to pay debts back to get over here, you know? And they're, they're like threatened and controlled, and they don't know the language, and they're encouraged not to learn the language, and they don't have any power. So workers' rights, it's a big deal, right? We've done a lot in the past hundred years with labor unions and other types of workers' rights to ensure that people aren't taken advantage of, that they're not treated as pseudo-slaves. Because there's a lot of pseudo-slavery still in our society, in many ways. And as the church, we need to make sure that we're stepping up for the people who are the most vulnerable, who are on the margins. The church needs to be the voice for those who don't have them. The people who, for no one else, is standing up for. There's always been the center mission of the church. That's why we come. That's why churches are so important, because people in our society, I mean, just the local parishes, people who aren't accepted anywhere else, who are weird, the handicapped, the mentally ill, right? The disabled, the people who are outcast, the people who have broken all their relationships and ruined everything else in their family, they can come to a church and what? Be accepted. Where else in our society are there communities that do that? And our country is richer because we have churches in our local communities who accept people as they are. And we need to make sure that we continue that mission of the church. That is, caring for the least of these. And really doing some serious work to help them. So thank God for our freedom. So let's show our thanks by working for inner freedom, by making sure our relationships are free, and making sure that we continue to fight for the freedom of others who need it. Because it's the way God Father, the Son, and the Spirit.